I did as quickly as others. So when I was in law school, I was able to spit out 3,000 words of everything I knew in a 90-minute exam and hope to God that something I said was relevant to what the professor wanted. Um, and that's not very fair. So what the word limit does is equalize you. put everyone in the exact playing field, okay? You have the exact same amount of space to explain your ideas to everyone else, okay? And it actually trains skills that should be relevant. Um, uh, all briefs that you'll ever write have word limits, and you always want more. So it's actually somewhat productive to try and use good word limits. But this actually equalizes people in ways they uh, uh, may, may not appreciate otherwise. But from the grain perspective, it makes it a lot easier. Because if I have, you know, a 500-word essay and then a 1,500-word essay, okay, I, can grade them. I can't really grade that equally. And I'll tell you, last semester I had one student I think it was in property, he gave me a 350-word essay, and it was excellent. Like, I first looked, I was like, wow, that's way too short, but he, he, or she killed it. So you can do good stuff with a short word count, right? Uh, any kind of overarching questions before I begin? Anyone have any feedback, thoughts? Yes, sir. Okay, so I did the, the other essay. I'm sorry. Know. I think I messed that one up. Well, that's fine, but I, I didn't really notice that. What I was thinking was... You said, like, what would be their best defense, or, like, what would O's best defense be? Uh -huh. Would you want us to give the defense and say whether or not he loses, or do you just want us to just... I, 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 I need to try to answer the question. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't... What was it said that your law clerk? Was that it, or...? Um, yeah, I think so. So... Yeah, the 11 one. Yeah. So, all right, so let me... I'll answer that question in the process of answering all the other questions, okay? So okay. let me start. So... Uh, the first thing that you should do, and can everyone see this is a font size big enough? Is font size big enough? Okay. Yeah, the other day I was teaching this, and those monitors weren't on. They're like, we can't see it. It's like I'm making the font bigger, and they forgot to mention those monitors are off. So the first thing you have to realize is what the setup is, okay? So in the Aladdin question, I think I asked, you know, uh, you're an associate law firm. Was that the setup? Uh, yeah. Right, okay, so... If, if the SEP is your associate law firm, then you're asking for what the best arguments are, right? If you're like a law clerk, you want to know how a court should resolve it. And those are conceptually different questions, right? If, if you're working for a judge, you should, what does the law say, right? And if you're working for a law firm, it's what's the best argument we can make? And those are just conceptually different inquiries. So just pay attention to what the uh, answer is. So the first thing that you should be doing before you even read anything is just read the instructions. Um, I try to make the instructions as clear and... Uh, 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 in, informative as possible, um, and I'll always try to I that. I will always try to indicate right in the instructions all the names of the parties and all the names of the properties. And the reason why this is important is because it, before you do anything, you should probably make some sort of table. Okay, I'd recommend making some sort of chart that lists each of the names and each of the properties. Because when you have a question like this, you can be guaranteed that you're going to have some really messed up fact power with property changing hands, okay? So, I mean, you could do something like this, and is, this is totally up to you, but, uh, so, so something like a table like this. Josh, you'll give us extra scrap paper. Scrap paper. You're going to have a blue book. I mean, they're, they're going to hand out paper blue books. You can do whatever you want. Okay. Yeah, but I'm just going to do it here just to make it uh, easy, but, you know, just something with, like, you know, there's six names, right, and was there four properties, whatever. Yeah, so like, you know, uh, you know, Adams, right? Yes? They don't let you, well, well, let me put it this way. The exam's open book. You can bring a notebook with you. I mean, the exam's completely open book, so, I mean, yeah, so you'll have paper with you somewhere. So, I mean, yeah, so you go, you know, Adams, whatever, Bashton, D, E, F, G, whatever. And I will always put the names in alphabetical order, so that makes it one less thing you have to worry about. It's always going to be A, B, C, D, E. And then you go, whatever, Vernon, right, Monticello, whatever, okay? Make a chart like this, because you're going to drive yourself crazy, because I'm, it's going to be something complicated like this. I mean, lots of moving parts and lots of dates. And then if you try and just add to this and kind of put all the different uh, uh, dates and things in, you can keep track. Because when you get to the end of the question, you say, well, who owns, you know, Monticello, right? That's going to require you looking at maybe two or three different aspects of the question. It's not going to be one aspect. So I find this chart helpful. If you don't, don't do it. Uh, the other alternative is a timeline, which is also helpful, which is I'll, I'll walk you through also. So when I give you the names of the properties and I give you the names of the people, find some way to index it out. Okay, all right. So it tells you names, okay? 
So here's the setup, and this is kind of Jeffrey's question, okay? Uh, more often than not, I'm going to say law clerk, but I might say associate. The law clerk question is saying, what should the law be? And the associate one is make you think of actually being a lawyer, of trying to persuade and make a good argument in either case. They're not always the same inquiries, okay? Uh, okay, so the year is 1782. All common law rules apply. Okay? I don't want to hear modern rules in this question. And when I say restatement first, that just means common law. If I, res if I say restatement third, that means modern. Okay, we, we've, we've only discussed the difference in a, in a, in a few number of cases, but uh, like with adverse possession and something with covenants, it actually does make a difference. So here, know that it's right here. Okay, no modern developments. Um, it had applied first restatements, but then they're also moving towards the modern frame. So yes. if you say something like that, I want you to do both. Want you to do both. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I did that. I did that in the practice. I think there was one particular issue. I can't remember what it was, and I'm sorry, Jeff, for making you do the wrong one. But there was an issue there where it actually changed, and I wanted to test you on both. Okay. But but for this question, only only one. Okay. Okay. So if I say the period of adverse possession is whatever three years, the color of title, and five years without, there's going to be an adverse possession issue here. Okay. I wish there was a way that I could not put this instruction in so I can make you guess at it, but I can't. So I need to tell you, and even if you get what color if you forget what color of title is, it's right there in the instructions. This one, this one's a freebie. So you're gonna you know there's gonna be some sort of um, adverse possession question, it's gonna be unclear if it was color of title. That that's exactly what this is getting at. Okay? And a notice recording statute. Um, remember there's a, a race, race notice, a notice. Um, last year one student, oh she killed me. She said, well, Professor, you said it was a common law jurisdiction, so notice didn't exist then. And she ignored the last sentence of the instruction. She wrote her entire exam using a race statute, which is not what... The, and it killed me. I had to give her a bad grade because I was like, that's not what I said. So if I say it's notice in common law, then that's what it is. There's no... Um, I'm, I'm not trying to trick you there. Like, don't ignore a sentence in the instructions, okay? Uh, one other notice. It's often somewhat nebulous. Something's an easement or covenant, okay? If I called an easement, it's an easement. If I called a covenant, it's a covenant. When I gave the exam, there were maybe one or two people, and they said, well, Professor, you know, that thing about the vineyard, it sounded a lot more like an easement than a covenant, or maybe the other way around. I can't remember. I was like, no, no. And he, he did everything correct, but he applied the wrong analysis. So if I called an easement, it's an easement. If I called a covenant, it's a covenant. Don't, don't blow that. I'm not trying to trick you. Um, the, the differences are so subtle in many cases that it's almost not even worth it. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Okay. After you read the initial instructions, I jump down to the bottom. And this is what I call the prompt, if any of you, like there are a couple teachers in the room, the prompt. And this is what you should have done in your LSAT and everywhere else. So at the end of the question, I'm going to say uh, something like the litigation begins, right? And there's going to be maybe four, five, or six uh, distinct questions, right? If I was, you know, a jerk, which I don't want to do, I would just say discuss, right? I would just give you a massive factor and say discuss. Okay? I, don't, I don't want that. I want to test you on very specific things. And what I want to test you on is really the state, I'm sorry, each of the four properties. So we have with a, a Vernon, Monticello, Gunston, whatever, okay? By the way, everyone knows what I'm talking about, Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, Monticello is Jefferson's home, uh, Gunson Hall was George Mason's home. Um, anyway, those are places in Virginia. Okay, so the first question, okay, so we, we don't even know anything, but, you know, there's going to be some sort of trespass and quiet title. Where have we talked about ejection actions? Well, we only talk about that really in the adverse possession context. So that should train your mind, thinking, okay, there's going to be some adverse possession issue here. Okay, go down to question number two. Uh, there's some sort of foreclosure sale. Okay, where did we talk about foreclosures? Well, we did that you know, on mortgages. Remember, we had the entire thing that sometimes foreclosure sales are, are, are no good. Okay? So that's just something to think about. Then there's some more uh, evictions. Uh, okay, we have a covenant. It says covenant right in the question. So, okay, you have to know something about covenants. Uh, okay, so there's a fence. And where do we talk about fences? We talk about fences with easements, and then you block the easements to cross over things. So... Even just reading these, you know, okay, we got easements, we got covenants, it'll just put you in the right mind frame. I don't have to type it there. Uh, yeah, and again, there's more fences. You have with me so far? So let's walk through the valley of the shadow of... Never mind. Uh, okay, so... Da, da, da. 
Okay, the reason why I think either a timeline or a table works is that there are going to be a lot of transactions with dates, and each of the date will be significant. And why are dates so significant? Well, a lot of the things that are proper to involve notice and recording. When do you do something, and then when do you actually record it? Because depending when you actually record it, that might impact the notice. And if someone doesn't have notice, it might be a different outcome. So that's why the dates are important. Also, dates are important for adverse possession. You've got to start keeping track of, of how much time elapses between various things. Especially you have to consider tacking. That's also an issue we've talked about. All right, so we have here at the outset uh, this paragraph. So we know that uh, Cashington is on Vernon, um, Efferson's on Monticello, and then Gason lives on Gunson. So those, if you have your chart, you can you know, mark, mark those off in the initial uh, uh, rounds. Okay? Then they reach agreements. Okay. Uh, okay. So keep track of the date. So on, on January first, uh, 1770, they each sign an easement to give each other access to all three properties. Okay. This would be an easement at tenant, not an easement in gross, because it, ga it gives the owners of these properties a land across. This is also a little bit different. I don't think I've ever given you an easement with more than two people, and I'm going to try and mess stuff up with you like that. I'm going to give you something slightly different. But there's really nothing conceptually different. You have three parts who, who signed an agreement, uh, an easement. Okay, so the easement begins January first, seventeen seventy. Okay, then this is another thing that kind of is a wrinkle. Also, on on January second, nineteen seventy, um, Efferson sells the vineyards on Monticello. Okay, now this is this is a little bit different. We've never actually sold parts of property; we've only sold entire things. But there's nothing wrong with it. If you have a piece of land, you can decide to chop it up into two pieces and sell part of it. Right, we, we might call this subdividing today, but you know, there's no reason why you why you can't do that. So he sold part of the land, which was just the vineyard. But when he sold this land, he put put a covenant on it. Right, the covenant said you have to farm it, but whatever every, every other year. If you're thinking back in terms of uh, covenants, we think of horizontal privity. In order for there to be horizontal privity, at common law, there must be a transaction for the sale of land. Okay, so you're thinking here, okay. We don't know where this is going, but there's going to be horizontal privity at this point. Now, it wasn't recorded. That's also significant because people might not have notice about this covenant. Okay? Roger. Yes, sir. I have a dumb question. No, it's not dumb. So when he sells just that small vineyard, yeah. small part of is that now part of Monticello or is it its own free? It, it's effectively its own free thing. It's like a separate, it's like the vineyard, right? So say like, you know, you have black acre, right? And you chop the two pieces, one acre and two acre, right? The, the bigger portion is still called black acre, but then the other portion would be something called something else, the vineyards. Yeah, a lot of people were confused by this last year, but just conceptually, it's just selling part of your land, right? And the covenant that only applies to the vineyards. Okay? So let's go to the next paragraph, okay? This is just giving you a sense of, uh, you know, what, what, what's about to come. Uh, and my question is, people, oh, no, no one, did no one die in this question? Is that possible? Oh, I messed up. No one died. Okay, usually lots of people die, but there's always things that go horribly wrong. Okay, so we now know that. Uh, now we begin to the tough, tougher part. So Cashington goes to war. Okay, and then Hamilton, of course, is, is Hamilton, who actually there are rumors that, that Alexander Hamilton is George Washington's legitimate son, but they're not very credible. Uh, George Washington did spend some time in the Caribbean, and uh, anyway, unimportant. So Damilton uh, enters and begins squatting on January 1st, 1776. So put in your notes somewhere, 1776. And what do we know? Well, if there's color of title, it's three years, right? And if there's no color of title, it's five years. So ask yourself, is there any kind of color of title with this squat? And I think the answer is no. There, there's no color of title. So just uh, Damilton by himself, it, you have to go to the five-year period, which would put us in, I guess, 1881, okay? So the second you see the word squatting, think of how much time it's going to do. Okay? But then interestingly enough, later that year, uh, Cashington wrote to Damilton to get Vernon. Okay? So it's actually a tricky question, and it goes both ways. Do we even count the time he was squatting when Cashington didn't know about it? Right? One of the, uh, the uh, elements is open and notorious, and, and you know, there, there has to be notice. The guy was at war. He didn't even know. So when do we actually start tolling it? Well... You could say we actually start counting at Christmas on 1776 when we crossed Delaware. And what did the letter say? Get off. Okay. 
And again, this is a judgment question. Is that sufficient for an ouster, right? Is mailing a letter sufficient for an ouster? Uh, probably not. You would probably need to move some sort of a court order or something like that, but I would accept either answer. You, you know, if you say this is good enough for an ouster, it's good enough for an ouster. Yes, sir? How can, how can he learn of the squatting on Christmas when it didn't start until January 1st? January comes before December. Oh, 76, they're both 76. Okay, right. So 70, oh, okay, so it's been a year, basically. Yeah. Okay, did, I, did I mess up the dates? No. no. Good? Okay. Yeah, January 76 is 11 months before. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. My, okay. Okay. I, okay. I, I try hard not to mess up the dates, but I hope that, that's my biggest fear. Because, uh, anyway. So, right, so basically there was an entire year that elapsed where Cashington had no knowledge of the squatting, right? So he wrote this letter saying, get off. Now, uh, gingerly, uh, Hamilton ignores the warning, and uh, he actually lies and tells people that Cashington had given Vernon, okay, and people believe it. So that may actually affect the claim of right, uh, but it's, 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 it's probably deception anyway, so I think, I think that the clock's ticking starting on Christmas 76. Okay? So then, later the next year, so in August of 77, uh, Damilton purports to sell something. Now, I put sold in quotes. I, 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 was, I was trying to be cute, but on this exam, you almost have to assume that when someone's selling something, you don't actually own it. Okay? There's going to be a lot of fraudulent conveyances. When someone says, I'm selling you something, just almost put in your head like, they don't own it. They, they, they don't own it. But, as we know, it often doesn't matter if they actually own it, because you can actually transfer property that you don't own, and if the person's a BFP, they get to keep it. All right, so they sold on August 77, the property to Vernon, and he gave him a forged deed, okay? And he, he recorded it. So when you think of forged deed, what do you think of? Well, you start thinking of color of title, right? You start thinking of color of title. Was there something to give him some sense that it was legitimate? So we now know three years for color of title, right? The three years starts ticking on August 1st, 77, so... Put in your notes somewhere, I guess, August 1st was in 1980, uh, 1780. Okay? Then we also see in the next sentence, uh, every day he was shuffling uh, uh, along the path connecting all three properties. Okay? So what's this telling you? He's going for a prescriptive easement. Right? The reason why I say every day is because you need a continuity. So every day he's walking across his path, and he's going for a prescriptive easement. Again, that would kick in August 2nd. 1780. Okay. One other thing that, this is actually a trick question, I'll be honest, I don't know the answer, but I, I like to see people thinking about this. How does tacking work here, right? Are they in privity? Well, I think they are, right? But what's the requisite period of limitations, right? Because the first guy was there for roughly a year from, actually, it was okay, so from Christmas until August, so like nine months, whatever it is, right? He didn't have color of title. So he would be under the five-year limit. The second guy, I think we go to the end, he's only there for two years and change. He had color of title, so he went to the three-year limit. I'm not even sure I know the answer to that one. I, I tend to think that courts would put the five-year limit there. That, that'd be my guess. But I think you can actually make a decent argument for the tacking you apply the shorter one. But I, I would accept either answer, but that's probably getting a little too deep. But, but you see, I, I'm going to try to mess with you, right? And I'm going to give you these weird scenarios. I want to see how you approach it, and I don't, I don't have any one right answer in mind. I often write this, that there are several answers, uh, many answers, in fact. There are a lot of ways you can get yourself to a good grade in this class. There's not one path, which is why I'm always reluctant to show you the, the A paper from last semester, because you might disagree with it and say, oh, Blackman, he missed this, and he missed that. I'm like, yeah, you're right, but it's, it's a good analysis. So let's move on. Okay. So then we have this paragraph. We have, uh, uh, during the revolution... Uh, he falls behind on, on his mortgage, and they uh, they foreclose the land, okay? And the foreclosure sale set. Uh, the foreclosure sale uh, set, and the sale is supposed to be starting at 10 a.m., okay? And they accidentally hold it, or not accidentally, they they intentionally hold it an hour earlier at nine. And uh, we did do some cases about this where uh, foreclosures had to be uh, conducted according to certain procedures. You you can't hold them haphazardly. And if you announce officially that's going to start at 10 and it starts at 9, that's a bad foreclosure sale. 
Even worse, who's the only guy who shows up? The president of the bank. And then he bids you know, $1 more than the amount owed on the note. And I think we did one or two cases like this where it said uh, the bank has some sort of fiduciary duty to try and actually you know, make a profit. And it's very suspect when the only person who shows up to the sale is the bank owner. Okay? And then Gason arrives her late. I guess he had other things to do. Uh, and he's like, hey, you shouldn't have sold this off. And you know, Franklin's a wise ass. He's like, you know, early, early to bed, early to rise, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Then he says, okay, I'm going to challenge a foreclosure sale. One thing to keep in mind about foreclosure sales is it's one of the rare instances where you can actually set aside a sale of property. In some cases, courts will actually, because the foreclosure sale wasn't good, we will set it aside. And that might even affect subsequent bona fide purchase for value. So, like, if you're a BFP and you buy land at a foreclosure sale, and the court finds the foreclosure sale is no good, even though you're a BFP, you lose it. This is a little bit different, because in this case what happens is Franklin sells it to someone else. Actually sells it to two more people. So there's a double BFP issue. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in a few moments. Okay. All right, so now uh, Franklin, yeah, he, he makes two, I even say fraudulent conveyances. So first on uh, September 2nd, he sells a gun stand with a quick claim deemed to Adams. And Adams is a bona fide purchaser for value. He has no knowledge of this, you know, bogus foreclosure sale. And then the next day on, on uh, the 3rd of September, uh, Franklin sold guns to Bass with a general warranty deed. Okay? And we all know the difference between the quick claim deed. The quick claim deed has no warranties or assurances. And the general warranty deed is the gold standard. It has all these promises baked into it. All right, then we have some more transactions. They both are. I'm going to get to who wins, though, in a moment. Okay. Or actually, I'll stop here and say this. So we're in a notice jurisdiction. They both were bona fide purchased with that val for value without notice. Neither had any notice. So between uh, uh, A and B, uh, who wins? Okay. Well, in a notice jurisdiction, we actually will we'll look further to see who, who actually records without notice. Okay. All right. So now, Gason finally records the deed in the covenant uh, from Epperson in the vineyard. This is from a long time ago. Okay. Uh, Badison records first, and he records without notice. And in a notice jurisdiction, he wins. Madison had no notice, he recorded first, so he wins. Adams records second, too late. Why? Because when Adams went to go record, he had record notice that Madison recorded the day before. Had Adams gone to the records office on the 6th, he was seen that on the 5th, he recorded, you know, done deal. He, he, he loses. Okay? All right, so now we go on to the 7th of September, and we have this dispute, right? So both Badison and, and Adams try to enter at the same time, and they dispute. Now, we already established that Badison um, wins as a matter of, of you know, who has no, uh, under a notice recording statute. But it seems that they reached some sort of, sort of agreement where they agreed to just, you know, live there together. Okay? But here's where, here's where it gets kind of messy, right? What about the vineyard? What about the vineyard? So recall that the covenant with the vineyards, which is, again, effectively a separate chunk of land, had been recorded the day before. So in theory, when Badison went to the records office to check about it, he should have seen that Monticello no longer had the vineyards on it. Right? When Badison went to the uh, records office on the 5th, he should have seen the day before that there was some deed recorded that said, hey, what used to be on Mount Lachello, these vineyards, are now somewhere else. You can measure you know, the meets and the bounds. And you should have also seen that there was a covenant on that vineyard. And what the covenant says is you can't farm it consecutively year after year. So really, at this point, neither Addison, no, I'm sorry, neither A nor B had any claim to the vineyards. They didn't. Because the vineyards were separate. They, they, they were actually chopped off from whatever foreclosure sale there was. I'm sorry, uh, they, they were chopped off from the, the rest of Monticello. I'm mistaken. Okay. 
But in any event, Madison, uh, he was not interested in all of Gunston, uh, wants just 10 of the vineyards. Yeah. Yes, sir. When these qualified purchasers, Madison and Adams, are buying these from Franklin mm -hmm. on the second and third, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be the time that they would be checking the record when they're when they're being conveyed the property? They would do their due diligence. Well, at that, what's interesting though is at that point, no court has set aside a foreclosure sale. Uh, but that, isn't it at that point where they would be presumed to have been? Given notice or actually notice. Well, look at it this way, right? So let's go back up. Uh, here it is. When uh, Franklin, I'm sorry, when Adams bought it on the second, right? What could he have known about the property? On the second. All he could have known in the second was that it was sold at a foreclosure sale earlier, right? Same, same for the second guy on the third. What could uh, Badison have known? All he could have known was it was sold at a foreclosure sale. That's all they could have had. So they were, all, the only thing they had noticed was it was a foreclosure sale, and they have no reason to think it was bad. I mean, we know it's bad, right? But no court had declared that. Yes, sir. Um, I had a question about the vineyard. Yes. So the vineyard was on Monte Carlo. Yes. So what does that, that have to do with um, the People trespass a lot. People, people trespass a lot, right? Yes. If he buys the, if he owns the piece of property and he likes the piece of the owner's own property, and buys it from, doesn't it become a piece of his own property at that point when he buys? So the vineyards wouldn't they have been attached to against him when he bought them from from my job? Yes, yes, and no. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes, and no. Although conceptually, one person would own both. Yeah, and for purpose of this question, it actually makes sense to separate them because there's a covenant on the vineyards only, right? The covenant doesn't suddenly swallow up the entirety of the land. The covenant only applies to certain areas, so conceptually, it makes more sense to separate them. But one person would own both. It matters for the rest of the question. If you come in front of the same estate, then Madison needs to be. Well, actually, in the, in the, the final question, I asked about the vineyard separately. Right? So that's why. Right, so I mean, it, it's better to say that conceptually they're different. Yes, sir? It's different because Madison sold it days ago. Yes. Um, it, but he sold it with the covenant on it. So, I mean, the rest of Gunston. Doesn't have the covenant. The only thing that has a covenant is like you know that square mile of whatever the whatever the vineyard is. So if we're if we're being the law, we're not even discussing whether or not the court's going to set aside the sale of the Franklin. Right? Well, that's one of the questions, isn't it? Right. That's one. That's one of the issues. But we'll get to that in a few minutes, okay? Yeah, also, in regards to the vineyard, real quick, um, that one in the, presumably been included in the foreclosure sale anyway because. Um, it was acquired by Grayson um, after, presumably after his guy's more got the vineyard. That, that's a really good point. Yeah, so I, I think a, a couple people wrote that last semester. That's actually a very good point. Yeah, that's true. But what he said was because the mortgage was placed on a certain piece of property, right, if he had acquired land subsequent to that, it would not be included in the initial note. That's, that's a really good point. There will be no mortgage on, on the vineyards. You have to make an assumption. That's what I would And I, 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 w I would accept either one, right? I would accept either one, but that, that's a good point. All right, let, let, let's let's move on to the, uh, where were we? Um, uh, where the heck were we? Okay, so they both, and by the way, and, and I was kind of answering John's question before I didn't get to finish answering it. People might be farming on land they don't own. So you can also assume they're trespassing. And you can also assume that might be another part of an adverse possession question, right? Just because someone's on land doesn't mean they necessarily have a claim to it. And depending how you follow through on this fact pattern, you can go either way. Okay? So here, what's interesting? So Badison was not really interested in all of Gunston. They decided to tend the vineyards. Okay? Badison's going to farm it anyway. And Adam's fine with this. So we actually have almost like an acquiescence, right? 
So we have two people, both of the same claim to land, and, and one of them just doesn't care. Okay. Now we have this. We have, in order to get to the vineyard, Baddison has to cross the path across Vernon and Monticello. So can Baddison rely on the easement apprehended? Okay, well, how the easement apprehended work? The owner of Gunson can cross across these lands. Is Baddison the owner of Gunson? And I, I think the answer to the question is yes, because he's the BFP uh, without notice. Okay. Yeah. Yes, 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 exactly. Yeah, that, that easement was initially recorded. So the next sentence, okay, it says, uh, Henry objects to Bass and crossing Vernon, he builds a fence, okay? So what have we studied before? If someone builds what they call spike fences, right? To block it. They can't. He had an easement, so we know that. Okay, it says, give me entry, give me fence. I think I put that in just to get, use this line, okay? Um, Adams objects to the fence, which also blocks his access to Vernon, and he built stone fence. Now we have several fences and, and likely violation of the easements. Okay, then we have the next one. All right, so Cashin comes back to this picture. Recall at this point, there's barely been, what, like two years that have elapsed since that initial letter on Christmas. Uh, and he learns of the sale to Henry, and he writes a letter to Damilton to change his mind. He says, hey, uh, you can stay there until the war's over, uh, so long as you continue farming it. Uh, but Henry can't live there. So what does that do to average possession? Well, really, that kills any kind of uh, uh, hostility, right? It's permissive. So really the clock, wherever you started ticking, stops ticking here, which is why the other issue was important, that the clock stops ticking here. Um, I had this wrinkle just to mess with you, but there's actually an issue, uh, there's a statute of fraud issue. What if this is not in writing? Is it valid? Because you have to have this party to, to, to be charged as a sign um, A couple people actually said this was a form of a license, that the initial letter was a license, which is also interesting, uh, which would also stop the average possession clock. Um, Damilton never shows that to Henry, so there's, he has no knowledge about this, but he continues squatting. Okay? All right, so uh, in 1981, the King Army set up for Monticello. Uh, this actually happened. You know, Jefferson was a coward. He fled from Virginia when the British Army invaded. Uh, yes, sir? Okay, quick question in regards to the letter. So, is Cashman's letter was only to giving permission to Hamilton? Yeah, he said it's Henry. Hamilton was wrong. That's right. The, the clock wouldn't stop working without picking on that. Henry. Henry. That, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Right. So, and, and that also further complicates the packing issue, right? Because it's these. I I make these really messy on purpose. Yeah, it, it's quite intentional. It's it's a messy packing issue because Damilton can't keep counting on his clock, but Henry can. But Henry can't get to three years without Damilton. But Damilton, anyway, it's, it's messy. All right, so the next one. Okay, so Jefferson abandons the property. Okay? And we actually did stuff about um, enforcement of covenants with abandoning land, which wasn't too significant, but that, that, might, that might actually come up. All right, so 1781, the war's over. All right? So by 1782, had, uh, what's his face, Henry been there for three years by himself? Yeah, he had. All right? So, oh, okay, so let's move on. Okay, so then here in 82, Cashman returns to Vernon, is prepared to ask Damilton to leave. He's shocked that Henry is there. Okay, Henry says, hey, I bought this land from Damilton. He shows Cashman the deed, and Henry refuses to leave. Okay, then the next sentence, Everson returns to Monticello, uh, and he founds that the soil was over-farmed. Okay, so remember the covenant. He can perhaps enforce the covenant, and that'd be a suit. And then Gacy returns to Gunston, and then he can't enter because of the fence. Uh, can he still rely on that easement if he's not the record owner anymore? Well, it depends on the foreclosure sale. So let's let's go down to the actual the the questions, and I'm going to toggle between the, the 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 top paper from last semester, which again is not perfect. Uh, I would probably do things a little bit differently, but it's good, and it shows you how it can be done in the uh, in the time constraints. So question number one: uh, Cashington sues to eject Henry for trespassing. Okay, and then Henry counterclaims. He files suit. So this, this number first question is effectively asking, you know, what what's the state of, of Vernon? Okay, let me toggle. Okay, here we go. Okay. All right. So we have to we have to look at the adverse possession issue and have this person handily says uh, uh, Henry acquired title by adverse possession through color of title. Uh, he took it three years. Okay. 
Uh, I think he meant tacking him. I <laughs> don't don't worry too much about spelling. I'll probably figure out what you mean. And I understand this time but he meant tacking. So tack can be allowed, but it's unnecessary because he held it for three years by himself. Uh, it was continuous, open, notorious, and hostile because um, the letter said he couldn't be there. Uh, and, and what's interesting is even even the second letter that was permissive only applied to Damilton. It did not apply to Henry. So I think Henry can uh, keep keep counting his three years. Uh, the, the essay also mentioned about the issue of disability, and we I think we did reference that once or twice, that if there's a disability, you stop counting. Uh, and in some states, they actually do toll it during military service, but that's, that's not necessary. Uh, he also wrote, when Cashington wrote to Damilton, he may have given it a license, but it wasn't signed. Uh, licenses are oral. They don't need to be signed. Okay? Uh, and we didn't really talk about wild titles this year, but also the, 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 the record chain was incomplete. Okay? So, so this one, you don't even really need the tacking issue. I think you can resolve it just on the basis of the three years by uh, uh, Henry by himself. Okay? Did anyone do anything a little bit differently for this? Um, and again, this is not by any stretch a perfect answer. And, and I, I, I'd be open to any other... Did anyone do anything a little... Disability, what the military service was, disability at the time. Probably not in the 1780s, but, but I would accept that. Yes, sir? Well, what about color of title, though? Yeah, I mean, that's right, but I, I think the essence of color of title is you have some sort of paperwork saying you should be there, and it's not valid. So I think the forge sheet will be enough to have color of title. Yes, sir, in the back? Uh, was that really in the facts? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't know what your argument is, though. Well, the argument is that he not notice. So notice of what? Oh, I see what you're saying. Because Cashington's so famous that he should, that Henry should have obviously known it was a bad deed. I think you're reading too much into the facts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I see what you're getting at, but stick, stick with the facts. Or, let me put it this way, if you want to make that point, you should state that clearly and say it stands to reason that Henry should have probably known about this, but I don't think that's, that's in the facts. Mm -hmm. Good question. Does it make a difference? But I'm just trying to clarify my mind. Um, for Henry to have a possession here, it can start on three possibilities. Either A, the date that uh, B started squatting, which probably doesn't, because he's not going to be back up. I agree, yes. Or second, whenever he actually purchased the, the, uh, the land. But then there's a problem because uh, Cashington didn't have notice of Henry. That's right. Or the third day is uh, when Cashington actually learned of Henry, which was a letter date. January is 79. It's more than bring years from that date. But if I was going to make an argument, if I was, since I'm a law clerk, you're not making an argument. The legal, you know, what would I recommend if it was less than three? Let's say it was January 1st, 82, as opposed to yeah. know, after that date. Yeah, and, and well, the thing is, I think you identified the three, the three starting points. If you started at the very end of when Cashin wrote that last letter, there's no way you get to three years. <laughs> Right? Cashington wrote that last letter. What was the date? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can pick any of those dates. Any of those dates, I think, would, would work if you explain why. Right? I mean, I think the first one, the, the initial date, is no good because you're not going to do tacking. I think either the last date would actually work. Yes, sir. With regards to the state of mind of the at common law, yeah, it's an objective standard, right? And and, and uh, Henry had no knowledge of any of this stuff going on because Damilton never showed it to him, right? And Henry had no knowledge whatsoever. So was the objective standard that the good faith one, or no, that was a one that was irrelevant? Yeah, no, I mean, you, you just look at the facts as they are. I mean, uh, how how an outside person would observe it, and, and there's no, nothing in the record to show that he had any notice or he could have had notice. Because none of this was ever recorded. But at common law with a good faith, like a bad faith, or something, would that defeat the. 
I'm drawing a blank. I, I think that sounds right, but I'm not positive. Is that part of the modern, modern term was object in the common law was I might be drawing a Saturday morning blank. I think that might be right. I think the one I'm I'm unfortunately. I thought the common law had to be possible in reverse and the modern term it had to be the state of mind was irrelevant. Yeah, I I, th I thought state of mind doesn't matter, but um For modern color. Modern, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, if there's color of title, they have it, it objectively has something to rely on. Yeah. Now, under common law, that would overcome the need for hostile possession. Yes. 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 You guys know this up well. Yeah. So there was no color of title. If there was no color title. The modern trend. So the modern trend is. It's state of mind is relevant. So before okay. it had to be actual. Oh, correct. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So do you want us to let you know what the claim of right is? Um, I think well, what this answer did was it said the letter, the hostility derived from like the letter, right? And I think that, that, that exemplifies the hostility there. So I think that would be a good way of addressing it. Okay? All right, good discussion. All right, let's move on to the second issue. Let me read it loud. So, okay, so now we have Gason uh, filing suit for Gunson, right? And he's challenging the foreclosure sale, so I think that was the question I asked before. Uh, both A and B intervened in that suit, and they each claim that they owned Gunston. They each claim they had it. So we have a couple things going on here. So first we have to consider the foreclosure sale. If the foreclosure sale is valid, then Franklin would obviously be able to convey it. Okay, if the foreclosure sale is not valid, then it gets interesting. In some cases, if a court sets aside the foreclosure sale, it would actually go back to Gason, but that's not always the case. So I, I'll, I'll accept either one. So let's let's see what the student wrote. Okay, so Gason would have won against Gunson because it was an improper foreclosure. Okay, so he's saying the foreclosure was no good. Okay, however, yes. I would prefer yes if you do more than this. Yeah, that, that that's a little it's a little thrifty for me. Um, and what's also tough is that other aspects of the answer were very good, and maybe the first part wasn't so good, so I have to kind of balance it out. But yeah, I, I, would, I would like a little bit more than that. Uh, however, in notice jurisdiction, the last BFP to buy off, I notice will win, okay? And this is Badison. So he's saying, even though the foreclosure sale was, was no good, there's a BFP. I would also accept the answer that because the foreclosure sale was no good, the entire sale will be set aside, and it will go back to Gason. I would have also accepted that. But, but th this works also. Okay. Okay, so G will have a claim against uh, I think he meant, I think he meant uh, F, but I think it's a typo. Okay. Uh, either way, when A recorded, he was on notice, right? Because B recorded one day, and the next day A recorded, he had some notice. Okay. A has a, a quick claim deed, so he, can, he can't really sue for anything for any of the promises. Uh, but there is a general warranty deed for B, but it doesn't really matter, okay? So here he says, um, even so, B would have required to by average possession by three years' color of title, uh, and, and then A was, was too short for the five years. Uh, I, think, I think what he was getting at is that he had some sort of color of title because his, the deed given to uh, B was no good. It was, it was an invalid deed but because he also squatted there. So there are two grounds on which uh, Basson in this answer could have gotten it. You've gotten it through uh, being a notice jurisdiction, because he was BFP, and also through average possession. I don't think you really need to talk about the average possession here, but, but he did. Okay? Uh, but also, there was no issue of hostility because A was allowing B to be there. Okay? All right. Did anyone do anything differently? Yes, sir. B recorded first, so this claim of right is superior than A. Um, in assuming the foreclosure sale was was good, okay, or, or I'm sorry, no good. My argument would be that A adversely possessed the land against uh, who was the original owner? G. Franklin. Oh, it's G. Okay. He was actually living there. I suppose the just farming it, right? Yeah, and, and B was just farming. Uh, was he, he was there? actually living there using it? 
That works. Yeah, that works for me. That's good. Yeah, that works. That's right. Anyone else do anything different? Is that they both appear to satisfy all the elements of adverse possession except for actual and exclusive possession? Yeah, that's a good point. Right. So, to your point, right? What was it exclusive? Because the other guy was there farming. Well, he's farming the vineyards. We're not actually farming. Right, and see, this where it gets, gets kind of funky. So, but I think your answer is also good. It wasn't exclusive because they were both there. Yeah. If, if, you, if, you, if you're seeing frustration, I accept both answers. I accept a lot of different answers to get you a good grade. I want people to make creative, good arguments. I think both of you make good arguments. Yes, sir, in the back. Is the whole actual possession of part of constructive possession of all possible? That's also a good point, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, each of you have just identified a really good topic to learn this year and wrote something good about it. So I, I will give out credit accordingly. Let's start hand somewhere here. Oh, nice. Yeah, okay. All, the, all good answers. Yes, so, ma'am. Can you ultimately conclude if the foreclosure sale is back that G is going to own it? Yes. Over everybody? Yeah, what you'd have to say there is because the foreclosure sale is no good, the court set aside the sale and it goes right back to G. And the G owns it outright. Okay. If the sale is good. Yes. Then there's privity. So assume that the sale is good, and it was just maybe in bad faith. Yeah. Give rise to. Yeah. Privity. Yeah. The, well, well, privity will only matter for tacking. Why? Why do you need tacking here? Yes. Okay. So we didn't get to the covenants yet. So if the sale was good. Then there will be vertical privity, okay. right? And I think that's that's the next question. But if the sale was bad, there would be no vertical privity, and then the burdens would not run. But we'll get we'll get to the covenant question in a second. All right, let's do three and four together because they're 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 close. Okay, so three says, um, Efferson sues the that is from the vineyards. Okay, uh, Gason intervenes and says he owns the vineyards. And then Efferson sues Baddison for violating the covenant on the vineyards by overfarming it. So let's see what the, the, uh, the student said here. Okay. Okay, so... Uh, okay, so uh, Gla uh, Gason did own the land he purchased it, but did not record until 77. Uh, but saying now Baddison owns it. And according to this answer, Baddison acquired it as a BFP. And if, Anna, you said he didn't, then this answer would be different. But will flow, flow from there. Okay, so now we're talking about covenants, right? Is there vertical privity? Is there horizontal privity? Well, we, we know that initially there was vertical privity because when the land was sold, the covenant was attached to it. Is there vertical privity? Okay, this answer says there's no vertical privity because it was a bad foreclosure, right? You can't have a, a two parties in privity if they're not, if there's a bad foreclosure sale. But if the foreclosure sale was good, then there would be vertical privity and then the burden would run. Right? And if the burden runs, then Jefferson, or I'm sorry, Efferson could actually enforce it and, and, and sue for violating the covenant. Okay? This answer also said, yeah, the, in this answer, neither the benefit nor the burden runs, uh, even though the touches and concerns. Also, uh, I think TNC is touching concern. He got creative there. Uh, he also made an abandonment argument, so it was good, but we didn't, but I don't think it's necessary. All right. Yes, sir. So, so in theory, what this guy said was you actually had through adverse possession. You could think it. You think of it either way, and, and I know. I know. I'm killing. It's making a difference, though. The answer. Well, in this answer, how did he treat it? I think he treated it as the same, right? He treated it as part of the original state. Right. So, so what's the problem? So, so if you treat it as part of the original state, what, what, what's the issue for you? Well, if it's And that, that's the point yeah, he made. I, I, 
I think what you said is probably better than what he wrote. Okay? I, I think that's... I'm trying to think if anyone else wrote that last year. Okay, so let me, let me explain what, what, what these two guys are talking about, okay? So the mortgage, as written whenever it was in the past, only included certain pieces of land, okay? That would not have included the vineyards because those were only acquired subsequently, right? So even if the foreclosure sale was bad, that would never touch the vineyards. Even if Madison purchased land, he would not purchase the vineyards. Okay? I think actually, if I would have made this question better, and I could always make these better, I would have written one sentence. I would have said, Franklin sold uh, uh, Gunston and in the deed it included the vineyards. If I included that one sentence, I think it would, made, it would have answered your problem. Because Franklin would have had a bad deed saying, oh yeah, here's everything including the vineyards. Because I think I think this is what I was getting at. At the time, the transaction of the vineyards had never been recorded, right? Is that right? Yeah. But not not at the time of the foreclosure sale, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So so I mean, in and and I'm getting way too deep, deep in the weeds here. By the time of the foreclosure sale, if the if the D just said Gunston, according to the record hall, it will still include the vineyards, right? No, the, the dealership vineyards are still part of Monticello. Right. Right, right, right. So it wouldn't be part of it all. Yeah. You just make an assumption go with it, right? Yeah. You know what? So so he, he, here, this is why these review sessions are always so difficult, because I make this really mess up fact pattern with all these other permutations, and there's no one good answer. So my, my advice for the exam is make an assumption and go with it. I, I like that. Because there are going to be issues like this, like... No, just make an assumption. So, for example, when Ian said it would not be included in the mortgage foreclosure sale, then just work from there. And, and just saying that would be correct, right? In other words, you don't need to disprove all the other, what, what Lucy said and what, what Anna said. Just make your assumption of how you view it and go with it. Okay? <laughs> Grading these things is, is really difficult. It, it, it's, 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 it's very tough because invariably people come up with stuff that I even think of. This always happens. Like I was doing a, I was doing a review session yesterday and it involved um, a hunting, right? And I had this thing where they were chasing sharks. And I said that sharks got caught in the coral reef, right? And I was thinking, okay, they were cornered like in Pierce be Post. Which said, oh, no, no. I thought the sharks getting caught was like using a net. And that was actually the capture. I'm like, that's a good answer. And it totally changed the entire question. So, I, I appreciate smart people with, with good ideas. Yes, sir. Hmm? Yes. Oh, of course you have to be consistent. Yes. Yes. I mean, it'd be hard to in do it inconsistent. That wouldn't make any sense. Yeah, but if you keep it consistent, then I can see. So, for example, several people give me different options, and, and I've said each one they're correct throughout. Like, for example, yeah, I don't, I don't have it. I don't have a set answer key for this, right? I'm gonna follow your logic through. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you give me a good answer, explain why I think you're good to go. I mean, this person, look what he did. He got to get an A, right? And he made certain assumptions about how things went, and he went straight through, and he got a good grade. Okay. Uh, where are we? Okay, we did the horizontal privity. Let's go to the last two, which I'll, I'll, I'll do in tandem. Okay? These review sessions are always so tricky. You think they sound good, but because you're trying to condense an entire year of common law rules that conflict into a single 500-word essay. It's not easy. It's not easy. Even writing these things are impossible, except when I write these, I have to try and think of every possible permutation what you might think of, and I never think of all of them. I always always miss some. So I, I didn't actually think of the, the, the foreclosure issue, which is very good. Okay, so five. It says, Badison sues Henry for constructing a fence in Vernon in violation of the easement. Okay? Then Henry counterclaims that he acquired the easement based on, you know, prescriptive easement. Uh, then Grayson, uh, Gayson sues for the fence. Okay? So let's see what this guy wrote. Yeah, we did, right, we did the horizontal and vertical privity. Right, this answer said there was no vertical privity because it was a bad foreclosure, therefore he's not bound by the covenant. 
right? Because at common law, you need horizontal and vertical for the birds to run. Okay. I think that's correct. I think that be yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. So what this person says is the easement follows both the land because uh, it's appurtenant, uh, and they can they can they could try to actually stop the easement by prescription. What does that mean? Uh, you can actually say even if they didn't have the easement based on the ownership of the land, if they cross it every day for whatever number of years, the the the, the, uh, the requisite statute limitations, uh, they can get it. But here they weren't there for five years. They didn't cross it continuously for five years. So they're not going to meet it. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. A stopping easement by prescription requires the same. Oh, he's really pushing here. Continuous, open, notorious, adverse, and hostile. That, that that's really pushing it. But if you use it, I'll know what it is. That that'll be your benefit for coming to the review class. That's that's really pushing it. And I think ROW is right of way. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah, I mean, we're pushing it, but I'll I'll, I'll I'll take it. I'll take it. Just just hyphenate right of way. I don't know if that burns your three words. I don't know if you check on. Okay, good. Okay. So even then, if a right of way was necessary, uh, oh, he's talking about it being landlocked. Okay, even by necessity. Okay, that that wasn't really in the question, but you know, it was in a related idea. Uh, which shows me he was thinking somewhere else. Okay, there's also an abandonment issue. Uh, okay, continuous. Let's see, anything else I want to talk about that question? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you have to address who owns the land and if any kind of easement by prescription was defeated. Because if they obtained an easement by prescription, they can't put up a fence in, in, uh, in, in its place. Okay. Anyone do anything kind of different for that question? Yes, sir. I can get to it. Okay. I my 500 words. I got into a heck of a lot more detail than that is. I'm trying to think as far as time management. I don't want to press it. Um, that's good. Right there. That, that, that was the highest grade in the class. Okay. Or, or, or close. <laughs> it might not have been the highest, but it was close to it. I can't remember which was actually the highest. I remember something about easements and you don't use them for some years or whatever. You can abandon them. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what he's getting with the abandonment issue. Yes, sir, Brad? Is there an issue with the uh you know, the one stock rule where there, there's multiple people that own the easement, they like all have to vote on whether or not it's yeah. allowed. Yeah. If they all voted the defense was okay, then that's not right. But. Yes, we did do cases on that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Again, yeah, there are lots of ways to answer these questions. I mean, uh, just just to give you an insight to my mind, the way I write these questions, I go through all the cases we did, and I pick out fact patterns, and I distort them. And I, this should all look somewhat familiar to you. You've seen cases like this, but they're just different. And you don't know which rule you want to pick, but there are a lot of different ways to approach it. Okay. What else? On this beautiful Saturday morning and the coldest day of the year. What else? Just curious, um, since we're talking about it, when you're going through the cases and the cases that we've covered, that also includes talking about some of the notes and developmental history saying that sometimes the way the book is laid out, they'll say, well, we went into or this trend and this specific topic has evolved this way. That'll be relevant if I say you're, you're in the modern era. I mean, if there's been a, if there's been a departure of the common law rule, then yeah, that's relevant. Okay. Yeah, I mean, everything we covered is fair game. Yes, sir. So, for adverse possession, do we need to go through the elements for you, or if we say this is uh, likely adverse possession because you've hit the five-year mark? So, um, if you mention them, it's probably okay. But more likely than not, there's gonna be one element that's lacking. Okay, so just talk about the one that's. Probably. I mean, in, in, invariably, I'm going to give you something that's not quite adverse possession because there might be a question over you know, hostility, right? Or it might be a question over continuity, and you'll you'll know which one's probably more more in doubt. Okay. Or you should know if you if you get the facts. So abbreviations, lots of them, I guess. Yeah, that's fine. He said he was pushing it with Koa. That was really pushing it, but if you use it, I'll know what it is now. <laughs> I mean, because all of you in the room and you know, you have the benefit, you can say Koa. But I, I, had to, I had to think about that one. I was like, oh. If we are making them up on the fly, do you want to 
I, I'm asking because it's uh, I mean, 500 is not You know, it's so. So I ask you. So for all of your writing here, how, how was word was, was word limit impossible? Was it was it doable? Was this the format that you got this test? Yes. Part of my eyes. What do you mean? It's just ugly. <laughs> is that the font? Just all of it. There's a lot of I, you know the. the oh, you talking about the design or or? or all that. Just, oh, are you asking this what the student wrote? Yeah. yeah this is what the student wrote for me. It's it's tough. This is why it's Godwin with her handwritten. This is freaking impossible. Yes, Anna. Okay. Um. So, since they're you're writing maybe like ninety five words each of these questions, approximately, we're not doing some heavy analysis. We're really doing a nice, concise issue spotting. We're concluding. It's mostly I'm it's, finding it hard to. It's mostly the analysis, and and there's no one good, perfect answer to give. I'm really judging you based on what you give. Like I, I want to see you think. I want to see you understand the issues and and, and analyze them. That's what. So it doesn't have to be like beautiful and eloquent. No. Oh my funny. God. It's got to make a complete sentence. I mean, if I didn't find yeah. It was easy to read, no. Oh, they're like, not. Oh my God. They're not. No. Don't give me prose. I mean, I. These are not easy to read, but I I will dig and I'll figure out what you're saying. Yes, sir. No, don't no 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 English teacher. This is not right. I'm sorry, Capricia. It's not, it's not 500 words per. It's a nice try. No, I'm kidding. I wrote 500 words for. Each 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 of the five subparts. Yeah, I did like. Oh no. my God, no. No wonder I was going to go Oh my God, no. No 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 no. No no, I mean I mean, you know you know the expression RTFM. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, re read the sentence. A, a memo of no more than five words addressing the issues raised in this appeal. It says it very clearly. Yeah, I mean, that, well, you just, uh, you you have just gotten an F if you had done it in the actual example. I'm glad you did that here. And I, I've mentioned this at least a dozen times. I mean, it's five hundred words total, not not for each. So our whole exam is going to be a thousand words. Yes. So our whole thing is going to be. That's right. Yeah, everyone, everyone get that. I mean, I, I thought I made that really clear. Did anyone do that? I don't, I don't mean to pick on you, but that, that would have been an F. And, and I'm glad, glad you did that here. Yes, sir? Um, so the difference between this one and the Aladdin one is that there's like a set number of questions. Mm -hmm. Is that what we're, what we're going to see on the final, like two major questions with sub-questions, or are we going to have like a question with like open-ended, you know? No, it's not going to be open. I usually, I usually give like, like four or five sub-parts. So, so like, there's going to be two questions with sub-parts. Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair guess. And it guides you. I mean, I'm really trying to focus you on a very precise issue. Yes, sir. Ignore the extraneous. So, I mean, focus in on each individual issue, issue that you ask about first, and then if there's space, come yeah. back to fill in. Or... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, I want you to answer the question, and the question might in, invariably require you to think about different things, like the... The, the 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 gunsting question requires thinking about foreclosure, thinking about you know easements. You have like five or six different issues, but it's all in one question. Like when I say quiet title, I mean you have to address how will court resolve this. Okay. Other questions. The the framework question. It's like a letter from Kamal. Yeah. Well, we did we did we spent about three weeks on takings, didn't we? So right to uh, more of a discussion instead of. Uh, well, I mean, we, we did for takings like what, like eight or nine different tests, and you're probably going to tell me which test applies, right? Um, there was also, I think, a, a Lupa question there. Lupa, yeah. Yeah, so um, does the elements apply them? Yeah, yeah, we did, we, we did the, uh, uh, the, the, the Guru Nana case. Totally random, but I, I, I saw the judge who wrote that opinion. And I told him we studied in his class. He was very happy. <laughs> but he's a cool guy. Anyway, other things. What else? This is not about the jam prep. I'm just trying to gain some views on the questions on what we study. Mm -hmm. The differences between the modern and the modern trend. Okay. Um, might about it. That works also. Where, where we discuss the differences. 
I mean, I don't have an, I don't have a list in front of me, but with average possession, it matters. Uh, it matters with covenants. Um, nuisance, yeah. Uh, we we got like the coming to the nuisance stuff and like the. Uh, I think it matters for average possession and save mind. I think it matters for um, uh, covenants whether they the burdens and benefits run because at at modern law you don't need vertical uh, vertical uh, har you only need horizontal privity. What was that? Yes, yes, also, oh, also all the modern foreclosure stuff as well. That, that's the difference. I was going to say sign the deed, uh, the idem sonus. Yeah, that's, that's really small, but yes, that, that's an issue. Uh, what else? This is so hard for me to prepare for because I don't know what you're going to ask me about. It's like an entire like 28 class thing in one issue. Uh, easement by necessity also. Uh, courts are less likely to um, uh, apply easement by necessity under the common law. You need actual necessity. What else? Anyone else? Caveat emptor. Caveat emptor, right? With the uh, with the, the haunted house. Remember about the disclosure of latent defects. And under the common law, there was no requirement to disclose latent defects, but now you you do. What else? I don't have my notes here at all. Um, I, I don't know. Those are the only ones that come to mind. I'm sure if you go through the lecture notes and next book, you'll find other things. I can't think of anything of now. If you have a question, like an email to me, I'll say yes or no. But I, I can't think of anything no, else now. That's okay. You make up for it now. All right. Anything else? All right. Good luck, everyone. Good luck for the exam. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Have a happy uh, Merry Christmas. Happy Thank Hanukkah. You. Happy New Year. And I'll see you all on the uh, on the other side of the year. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. So, under um, privity and covenants.